everybody in the whole world knew exactly what happened to the Space Shuttle Challenger. Well, when he did that, he removed from NASA management all the technical ease uh, that they were trying to, you know, skirt around and confuse the public and the press with. And they were very angry behind the scenes with that man because he made something uh, very simple that they were trying to make very difficult in the explanation to the press and the public. After the hearings, Beaujolais and fellow engineer Arnie Thompson were reassigned, in effect, demoted. Beaujolais has since left the company. As in any group with an ideology, the people who told the truth which undermined that ideology, and here the ideology was that NASA could keep its missions going, and the companies that it could continue to supply quality products for that, those who undermined the ideology had broken the contract. You're no longer one of us. People who blow the whistle generally don't do it because they want revenge or they're angry personally. It's because they subscribe to the higher ideals of the group, the loftier mission, mm. the true values, the deep values. And they see that what's going on, that living the lie, is defeating the, the purpose of, of the company, the government, whatever it may be. So they speak the truth. But what they've done is to violate the canon which says to be part of this group, to be a member of this club, to be one of our family, you go along. The Challenger disaster cost Roger Beaujolais his job. It cost Morton Thiokol almost nothing. The company is still NASA's sole source for boosters and received a larger contract to redesign the boosters. It cost the entire nation a measure of confidence and prestige. And it cost seven astronauts their lives. Groups of all kinds, from personal families to the first family, require their members to choose, are you on the inside or the outside? Individuals who refuse to lie for the group can risk finding themselves on the outside. Some of these people I'll be referring to are friends. Some are men I greatly admire and respect. And particularly with reference to the President of the United States, like Sixteen years ago, presidential counsel John Dean was fired by Richard Nixon for refusing to help cover up the White House crimes known as Watergate. What did you think when you first heard about the Watergate break-in? Immediately, I flashed back on a meeting back in John Mitchell's office some six months earlier where Gordon Liddy had presented his plan. And I realized, obviously, it had been approved, it had been blessed, and it had gone forward. And you I, were at that meeting? When I was at that meeting. Shortly after the meeting, I told Bob Haldeman that I had to meet with him. And I went over and told him what had happened in Mitchell's office. And I'll never forget his reaction to me. He said, John, this is something you shouldn't have anything to do with. And I didn't. What did you think about that? I was uncomfortable with it. I knew I wasn't in a position to stop anything. I knew it was going on around me. I said, this isn't my, this isn't the way I would run the show if I were running the show. But I also said, I'm not running the show. I haven't been elected to anything. I'm a staff man. If this is the way it is, fine. In August of 1972, Richard Nixon, President Nixon, had a press conference, which you watched on television. What did you hear? Nixon was out here in California in San Clemente and having a press conference and was reeling off to the press. All the different investigations were going on. The Congress, the GAO was investigating it. Two committees on the, or three or four committees on the Hill. The FBI is conducting a full field investigation. Uh, the Department of Justice, uh, of course, is in charge. In addition to that, within our own staff, uh, under my direction, uh, the counsel to the president, Mr. Dean, has conducted a complete investigation. And I can say categorically that his investigation indicates that no one on the White House staff, no one. I was a counsel, and that was the first time I ever heard of my report. <laughs> He just told the press you had done a report. Well, you hadn't. You hadn't. Made it up out of whole cloth. When was the moment you turned around when you said, I'm not going to go along with this? I made it very clear that despite anything else they thought I had done for them, there was one thing I was not willing to do, and that was to lie. And that started with this whole thing over this, this Dean report. I was absolutely unwilling to do that. When you sat there telling the truth about the men you'd worked for, including the president, you had to know that this would bring the White House down. How did you feel about that? No one wants to be the whistleblower. We grow up not wanting that particular uh, role in life. Didn't the White House, including the president, inspire a lot of uh, unflattering stories about you? One of the Alsop brothers called your bottom 
dwelling slug. Uh, bottom dwelling slug, right. Daniel Shore put on CBS a report, anonymous a report, that you were afraid of going to jail for fear right. of being homosexually raped. Right. They called you a squealer. Right. And these were people you'd worked with. Exactly. This was your president. Well, I'm sure some of them to this day feel that way. That they, they, I'm sure a lot of them say, Dean should have probably kept his mouth shut and never testified. John W. Dean III. I believe the biggest mistake that Richard Nixon ever made was firing John Dean. John Dean was a loyalist. If he had not fired John Dean and he had kept him on, and I'm using the words of the White House, on the reservation, <laughs> that was the term, you're either off the reservation or you're on the reservation. If he kept him on the reservation and stroked him, which is another term they used, John Dean would have never broken. He would have stayed behind Richard Nixon all the way, and we would never really have learned the true story. It was by firing him and, and scaring him, because this was the most frightened young man I've ever met, who was now fired and away and so scared of what might happen to him that the rest of his strategy was to protect himself. There are two points at which people are most likely to tell the truth after they've been part of some complicitous lie. One is, as it's about to unravel, and they're going to be found out anyway, and then the stakes switch, because then the group you want to join is the outsiders, not the insiders. And the second is the moment at which an insider is about to become an outsider. Remember, he made his wonderful speech about the dangers of the military-industrial complex. My God, he'd been an intimate member for 15 years, but he never mentioned it until he was leaving the presidency. It was his farewell speech. And there he was able to speak. What does that say? It says that the force, the pressure to go along, to shut up, not to notice, and not to bring it up, is incredibly strong, even and perhaps especially at the highest levels. As Watergate unraveled, the rest of the president's men kept allegiance with their chief. Nixon's staunchest foot soldier was the man who conceived the Watergate break-in, Gordon Liddy. We would call Liddy in executive session. Uh, Senator was sitting next to me, and I called Liddy to come forward. Uh, he doesn't sit, he stands, he salutes us, and says, I only have to give you my name, rank, and serial number. I consider myself captured by the enemy. He saw it as warfare. You were the enemy. It could be funny, but it really wasn't, because what it really illustrated was that these people saw themselves as not only the super patriots, but anybody who disagreed with them or questioned them were their enemy. In the White House, Nixon fostered the warlike mentality of us versus them. If you're not with us, you're against us. From the Oval Office, he plotted how to destroy his enemies. This memorandum addresses the matter of how we can maximize the fact of our incumbency in dealing with persons known to be active in their opposition to our administration. Stated a bit more bluntly, how we can use the available federal machinery to screw our political enemies. Richard Nixon failed to recognize that we have a distinction between what is permissible when dealing with an international adversary and when dealing with a domestic rival. We can, it is permissible when national interest is at stake to lie to your international adversary. It is not permissible to lie to your domestic rival for your own political fortune. It wasn't that it was lying was the problem, it was who he was lying to and why. What is the truth about lying when it comes to this sort of thing? What is the truth about lying? Uh, there's no doubt that presidents do lie. I don't think that they always mean to lie, uh, but they are politically expedient animals, and they do it. We've been talking for 15 years about the lessons of Watergate, but just recently we had a president who took his policy off the books, went covert with it, went underground. White House aides, Oliver North, admit, admitted that he lied to the Congress, to the press, to the public. George Bush, the present president, was the Republican national chairman at the time of Watergate and defended Richard Nixon right up until the end. I mean, what did we learn from Watergate? As we've learned in the whole line of history of freedom, you never win the battle once. It's been said by every historian, by every leader, the lesson is eternal vigilance. It's just like roaches. <laughs> you know, you can spray, but the, the, God damn it, the roaches will still come out unless you keep spraying. And it's true in corruption in government, it's true in lying by government, it's true in betrayal of trust. After the Watergate break-in, 
Did anybody in the White House consider telling the truth? I don't think it was ever considered. And to this day, I don't know that we know everything that went on in that White House. I've often been struck by the fact that the parameters of our knowledge of Watergate really were my Senate Watergate testimony, and I know how little I knew. The Watergate crowd will tell you that uh, the first lie was a small one, the second was bigger, the third one was giant. I do think that on a personal level, lying is a slippery slope. Uh, by that I mean that we tend to lie more often once we get started. That's especially so for a particular type of lie. Once you, the first time you tell a lie uh, to the IRS, you think about it, you consider it, you consider the pros and cons. But once you've engaged in that lie, the next time you won't consider it at all. The first time you lie about what happened on that fishing trip, someone asks, hey, did you catch any fish? You think about whether you're going to tell a good story and look good or whether you're going to admit and be embarrassed that you, you, know, you got skunked. Once you have told the lie, the next time you get asked that question, you don't even think about it. You're not even aware that you're lying. You just run that one through so that we tend to lie without consideration the more we lie and the more we tend to do it. Personally, what about politically? Now, on the political level, it's the type of lie. It's how long the lie endures, how large the fabric that has to be created to support it. It gets dangerous when it endures over a long period of time and it gets dangerous when many different other aspects of the information process need to be distorted to support that lie. The Vietnam War, elaborate, long, deception that involved an enormous part of our society, where the military themselves become victims of their own deceit and not ever really, who can really know what's going on? Stretching out over such a period of time that the electorate, when they where exercise in their choices couldn't get accurate information. Very dangerous. 54,000 Americans died, count millions of Vietnamese died for, really for a deception. And the deception was that this president of the United States never let the American people know the true nature of the conflict, what it would cost to achieve our political goals. And I believe a president, at the minimum, has an obligation in, in a democracy like ours if you're going to commit troops overseas to let the American public know what the costs are. Few events in our national history have so shattered our collective lives as the Vietnam War. Military and civilians, conservatives and liberals, president and public, virtually everyone felt the double sting of betrayal and distrust. I served Lyndon Johnson when he came to power. I know he believed the vital lie he had inherited, that the security of South Vietnam was critical to the security of the United States. He also shared the particular delusion that victory might be cheap. In 1963, John F. Kennedy had said the spearhead of aggression in Vietnam had been blunted. The Pentagon had announced the corner had been turned, and the State Department had reported excellent results. When LBJ, a year later, discovered none of this was true, he made the basic mistake, one born of his devious and secretive ways and of his own belief in his powers of persuasion. Not knowing exactly what he would do in Vietnam, he kept shifting his goals while signaling that he might do anything. Hawks believed he would escalate the war. Doves thought he would limit it. Saigon thought he would stay and fight. Hanoi, that he really wanted out. He fooled everyone for a while because he had fooled himself. It was war, and it wasn't. He wanted it both ways. Like other presidents, Lyndon Johnson believed his deception was just. It was for an overriding good. His passion was to preserve his vision of the great society. The great society rests on abundance and liberty for all. It demands an end to poverty and racial injustice, to which we're totally committed in our time. Johnson clearly, above all else, wanted to change the face of American society. And the fact is, any action that would have led the American people or the public mind to perceive that we were about to go to war in Vietnam or that he was pulling the plug on Vietnam would have destroyed the great society. And when we say destroy the great society, we mean only that this one window of 1965 and 66, the, really the greatest reforming Congress perhaps in history, where more laws were passed to better 
the, and improve the condition of people in this country, Johnson did not want to lose that opportunity. And so two great streams converged in July of 1965. The Great Society, which Johnson loved, and which he saw as his ticket, not only to history, but perhaps to Mount Rushmore, and then the war in Vietnam. And so he consciously chose to deceive the American public on what it would take to achieve our goals in Vietnam. Johnson was very clever about the Americanization of the war. He allowed leaks to come from the White House, from the Defense Department, which led Americans to believe that he was considering mobilizing the reserves, uh, moving to a war setting, perhaps uh, moving to a war economy, taking some major actions which would raise Vietnam to the specter of, quote, a war. And so the headlines of the New York Times, the Washington Post, were very foreboding in July as the president consulted with his advisors. But it turned out to be a smokescreen. After this past week of deliberations, I have concluded that it is not essential to order reserve units into service now. Everyone if says, wow. We're lucky he's not doing that. He's not mobilizing the reserves. He's not sending 150 or 200,000 troops to Vietnam. He's only sending 50,000 over. And he's being a man of restraint, a man of peace, a man of compassion. We but the most important part of that decision was what he didn't announce. Secretary of Defense McNamara, upon whose plan all of this was based, had recommended that, Mr. President, if you do this, if you Americanize the war, my recommendation is to go to the American public and let him know the seriousness of this. Johnson, being concerned with the politics of the decision, rejected that advice. Why? Because Johnson recognized that if the public mind recognized that we were mobilizing reserves, this would look much more serious than Johnson wanted the public mind to perceive it because he wanted the public to focus on the great society. But soon, we would be spending more for Vietnam than for the entire welfare program. The president didn't want to raise taxes for fear of giving conservatives an excuse to wreck his domestic reforms and liberals his policies in Vietnam. Speeches about limiting the war were followed by new rounds of escalation. I'm still not sure all these years later that Lyndon Johnson was ever clear in his own mind exactly where it would end. But given two options, he always chose the one that if it failed, eventually brought more escalation. This made it hard to keep hiding the cost of the war in the closets of the Pentagon budget. It overheated the economy, and it led LBJ, like Nixon after him, to turn on his own people. Critics of the war were at first nervous Nellies who wouldn't support their own fighting men. Soon their opposition was un-American, inspired by the Kremlin. This too was self-deception. To undermine his critics, hold the great American middle, and show up his own sagging morale, Lyndon Johnson fell deeper and deeper into wishful thinking. I believe there is a light at the end of what has been a long and lonely tunnel. But the tunnel grew longer and the light dimmer. Sustaining public opinion became LBJ's consuming passion, optimism his blind spot. So in the relentless search for evidence of progress, the president's men put the brightest gloss on the most dubious statistics. Our field commanders report that enemy deaths in combat are averaging uh, more than 1,000 men a week. And to this number, of course, must be added the, the number captured. And the number captured in the last four weeks has been very high indeed, something on the order of 2,100. That's almost a third of the total number of enemy captured during 1965. Well, this uh, body count figure, which we've reported, is, in my opinion, uh, very, very conservative probably represents, uh, uh, I would say, 50 percent. Army intelligence was systematically underestimating the strength of the Viet Cong and systematically inflating the figures of enemy dead to tell the ambassador who would in turn tell Washington, because that's what Washington wanted to believe. Even at the end, after the tangled web untangled, and the last corner was turned to reveal a dead end. Even at the end, the lie remained to Lyndon Johnson vital. But let it never be forgotten. Peace will come also because America sent her sons to help secure it.
If you yourself have deceived yourself, which is, of course, the very worst price to ever pay, you yourself no longer have the information, then you don't even know that you're engaging in deception. How do we do that? How do we deceive ourselves? Well, usually that occurs out of, of, a, out of very strong needs to maintain certain images about ourselves and the world we live in. The war cost LBJ the office he so long had coveted. I shall not seek and I will not accept the nomination of my party for another term as your president. It cost a generation their idealism. Hell no! We won't go! It cost the lives of millions of Vietnamese. And it cost the lives of over 50,000 Americans. What have we learned from the lies of our collective history? As our generation heals from the wounds of past deceptions, what can we teach our children about truth? It's very hard for the young child to understand the issue of trust. That is, that if you lie, uh, you lose someone's trust. And then it's very hard to reestablish it. Nobody knows how to reestablish trust. Sometimes you can never reestablish it. You can't live as a family if you can't trust each other. Husband with wife, parents with kids. But it's easy to deal with the, even the young children about fairness. It's not fair to lie. What if everybody lied? But you know, people who tell the truth in public, whistleblowers, usually get into trouble. How do we make the world safe for truth-telling? Why are they getting in trouble by telling the truth? What's the motive? Uh, I mean, we like people to be truthful. Why don't we like people to blow the whistle? It's because we're afraid. We're afraid we're going to get in trouble. That's what they're doing. They're exposing us. We expect, just like many families expect, no matter what goes on, keep it within the family. No matter what goes on at the job, keep it within the job. Doctors are loyal to each other. They don't point the finger at the doctor who's the incompetent. There's a loyalty within the peer group. It's the conflict between a loyalty to a higher authority and a loyalty to your peers. Now, there are some arenas of life where you want people who are watchers, who are going to inform. You just have to protect them. It's a lonely role. It's going to be a lonely role. The truth about lies is that each of us carries within us something we dare not say that needs to be spoken. And we need to find the courage to speak it openly. The pain helped me grow. And the hope that I have today that I didn't have at the beginning of recovery, the hope showed me that I could feel joy and not just sadness. Nations, like families, can die of too many lies. The founders of our republic knew this and gave us the First Amendment so America would be safe for second opinions that challenge official lies. Because all of us are capable of deceiving ourselves, each of us needs a a personal First Amendment operating within. It would protect the quiet, fragile voice that occasionally rises uninvited to say, that's just not so, that's not the truth. Thoreau tells the story of a traveler on horseback who comes to the edge of a marsh. He asks a local youngster if the marsh has a hard bottom and is told that it does. But as the traveler sets out, he begins to sink. I thought you said this marsh had a hard bottom, the traveler says to the boy. It has, replies the youngster but you've not got halfway to it. Beneath the distortion and deception of life in America today, there is hard reality. Our Earth is threatened with pollution. Nuclear weapons have been accumulating worldwide at a cost of $1 million a minute. And the United States is sliding into an inferior status in the global economy. Yet our, our public mind is filled with images of an America where the vending machines are always full, the wounded always recover, and the bills never come due. We seem to prefer the comfortable lie to the uncomfortable truth. And we punish those who point out reality while rewarding those who provide us with the comfort of illusion. Reality is fearsome. But as we've learned in this series, experience tells us more fearsome yet is evading it. I'm Bill Moyers.
In two or three minutes tonight, we'll visit another part of the world where political lies have continued to exist. We'll learn more about apartheid and the filmed reports that you're not likely to see elsewhere. South Africa now is next, followed by the film tracing the social, political, and cultural development of the lesbian and gay communities before and including Stonewall, the 1969 Greenwich Village riots. It'll be before Stonewall at 11.30 tonight. By the way, tonight's final chapter of Bill Moyer's Public Mind will be shown again on Channel 32, Saturday afternoon at 5. You may remember his conversations with Joseph Campbell about myth. Well, Joseph Campbell will be speaking in lectures that have not before been shown here on KQBD, Transformations in the World of Myth, starting next Wednesday through Friday evening at 9, and the following Tuesday through Friday evening at 9. Two hours each night, 14 hours of new material with Joseph Campbell here on KQBD starting next Wednesday night.